forwarded. Uh, got it. Perfect. There we go. That, that's that's great to hear. That warms my heart, man. <laughs> I'm glad I've been able to be of such use. Um, I hope I hope I can live up to my reputation here. Oh, I'm sorry. What was that? Yeah, your book have a uh, impact halfway across the globe, Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that last night. I was like, wow, it's pretty, I don't know, that's just really cool. So thank you for having me yeah. here. Jing, anything? Anything you want to ask him? Uh, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Although I, I, I think one thing I'll be curious about is uh, to see if Kiers has any, uh, you know, sensing of uh, your personality type. <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat that one more time? Yeah, and, uh, uh, because Juan and I, we have, we've had a few conversations about uh, our own personality types. So yes, a part of me is curious, you know, what, what, what would be uh, your take on uh, either Tuan's or, or, or my own personality type? Because, but mainly, mainly for Tuan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I might have some thoughts by the end of by the end of uh, tonight, um, though I, I, it takes it takes a while to get familiar yeah. with somebody else's type so i i can make no promises i i make no promises of being like a magical guru who's able to see through what your type is but um but uh but you know i i i can certainly make a guess and watch how you two bounce off each other um yeah. Yeah, let's get right into it here i'm just setting things up so i make sure i see everybody okay cool um so you're, you're about to join me down the rabbit hole of this more complex uh, advanced system known as cognitive function theory or Neo-Jungian theory. There's a lot of different terms for it, but um, let's just hop right in. So the way that it works, and this is, this is taken straight from the way that Jung structured it and then moves into new territory from there. So we began with perception and judgment. These appear in the MBTI test as a dichotomy pair. Um, in Jung's theory, they serve a bit of a different role. So perception simply refers to how you perceive the world, how you, what it does is it, it takes in information and it doesn't categorize it. It doesn't make any judgments about it. It is only interested in what the things are that that are being perceived and are coming into the personality, um, into your mind. Judgment, as it's been laid out here, assigns some sort of value to these things. It, it categorizes them, it judges them. So these two are opposites, but they're complementary. So we start, we start with perception and judgment. And from there, perception has two flavors or there's two kinds of perception. And in the same way, there are two kinds of judgment. And there, there are slight, there's at the moment slightly different theories about precisely the correct way um, to justify the splitting them into two flavors. But for our purposes, we'll just take it for granted and say perception has two flavors. One is sensing or sensation. That's the perception of what is actually there, the here and now. It has to do with the present. It also has to do with concrete objects a lot of the time, um, whereas intuition is a perception of the future, of underlying patterns, of um, the possibilities of things is how I often try to refer to it. So sensation is almost like a more direct line to the object, whereas intuition tends to kind of go around it to things that are implied by the object. So sensation is generally very concrete, down to earth, Intuition is very creative, but can also be very head in the clouds about things. Um, so those are two ways of just perceiving the object. Judgment also has two kinds, thinking and feeling. And it's important to, to note that, um, uh, uh, and you're all able to hear me okay, right? Just wanted to make, okay, just wanna make sure. Um, thinking and feeling, you have to, it can confuse people sometimes because uh, the, we use the terms thinking and feeling in a very different way from how they are more precisely used in Jung's theory. But as Ching has, has laid it out nicely here, judgment uh, thinking 
is judgment of the quantifiable um, and feeling is judgment of the unquantifiable. There's a correspondence, at least in, in my theory, my approach to it, between thinking and sensation and feeling and intuition. Because thinking has to do with judging things in terms of rigid categories and logic, which have more to do with what is actually there. Whereas feeling has to do with value judgments. It has to do with ethics. It has to do with how you and other people are feeling. So that's sort of the distinction. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And before I move forward, our, our, I should... I feel like I should ask uh, questions if anybody wants further clarification before I move forward. Um, it's okay if there isn't anything, but. Okay, well, we'll, we'll just keep moving forward. I'll, I'll assume, oh, yeah, Shane. Yeah, so we have some, maybe some guys here with questions, but uh, they're very shy. Yeah, no worries, we'll, we'll collect the questions and then raise it up. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. We'll just do that then. Yeah. So you can, you can message questions to Cheng, or if you don't want to do it through Cheng, then you can interrupt me and say, hold on, <laughs> hold on here. Yeah. Slow down. Okay. So, so now we have four functions and note we've just sort of built them beginning from perception and judgment. And we've built our way up to sensation, intuition, thinking, and feeling. Um, which again, you would recognize those from the MBTI, um, the, the Myers-Briggs test and other tests online. Pardon me. So now we're going to do the division game again. We're going to introduce a new dichotomy, introversion and extroversion. And by doing that, we will uh, multiply the four functions into eight cognitive functions. Um, Extroversion is an attitude. It's a, it's a focus on what we call the object. So I, I perhaps should have started with this, but um, just so you understand the terminology, the object is anything that is not you. It is, it is the thing that you are focusing on. Um, in order for anything to happen in psychology, you have to have an object and you have to have a subject. The subject is, is the mind. The subject is the person or the, the being that has the psychology going on inside them, as it were. And for every subject, there needs to be objects that that subject can think about and can focus on. Um, and in some sense, what psychology is, is psychology is where the subject makes themselves into an object for their own subject if that makes any sense, but that's, that's more of a side note. The important thing is that for extroversion, there is this, as it were, outwards turning um, and, and outwards focus towards the objects that are out there um, in the world. And introversion is a turning inwards to the way that your own subject is. So in some sense, introversion, you could say, is making an object of your own subject, but I don't want to start getting into loops of language and so forth. The more important thing is the outward motion and versus this inward motion. And so we can split up sensation and thinking and feeling and, and uh, intuition via extroversion and introversion. So we would get extroverted sensation, introverted sensation, extroverted thinking, introverted thinking, so forth. And you can see that uh, the little chart over in the corner, it'll be useful going forward. Um, I know this is a lot of information, but um, you'll notice in the little chart up here in the corner of the eight functions, they have there are abbreviations. So FI would be introverted feeling. So the F is for feeling, the T is for thinking, the S is for sensation, and the N is for intuition. Even though intuition starts with an I, it's abbreviated with an N, so it doesn't get mixed up with introversion. And then each of those has a little I for introversion after it, or a little E for extroversion after it. So that's the notation and how that works. Um, and it's a lot 
faster to just write, say, FE rather than extroverted feeling, because that would get, get, get me a lot of letters on the page. So finally, we have eight cognitive functions. And now what we're going to do is we're going to arrange these functions in order to get 16 different personality types. Um, and in fact, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll move into the 16 types in a little bit. For now, let's just talk a little bit more about the eight cognitive functions. So I believe that'll move us to the next slide. Perfect. And yeah. So well, let's just run over these cognitive functions. So just so it's clear, um, the way this is going to work for the personalities is, um, you know, well, I'll, I'll hold off on that. I'll hold off on that for a moment. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's just run over what these cognitive functions are and how they work. So we'll start with sensation. There's two kinds, introverted and extroverted. I'll start with extroverted sensation. Going by our definitions, extroverted sensation would be sensation, but it is directed outward, as it were. It is directed to objects in the here and now. And some of the results of this for a personality is that somebody who is, pardon me, somebody who is, as it were, using extroverted sensation or is what we call an extroverted sensing type is someone for whom that is the dominant uh, function that they prefer to use. Um, there tends to be a very, as it were, carpe diem, uh, <laughs> YOLO, I love that. Um, you only live once. Uh, living in the moment, thriving on uns uncertainty. There's a very, people who are extroverted sensing types, in my experience, um, thrive in um, situations where there's a bit of chaos and and it, it can stress them out as well, but they're often much better than introverted types at dealing with that because they're just going moment by moment and they see what concretely is happening around them and they just they keep track of everything and they move and flow in order to adapt to what is happening in in the moment. So, you know, uh, uh, emergency workers, firefighters, police, a lot of people who have to deal with emergency situations. Um, but it doesn't just have to be that. Um, it, you can, you'll still find them in, uh, in more academic disciplines at times, um, though that, that is usually through focus on other functions. So that's extroverted sensation, very in the moment. Um, introverted sensation reverses that in an interesting way because the sensation is directed inwards. So introverted sensation, there's, there's a, there's a uh, not in a political sense at all per se, but there's a kind of conservatism. They're much, they're much slower and more removed from the outside world uh, as compared to the extroverted sensor. They're much more, um, it's perception of the here and now, but brought inwards. So there, there's often, my mother, for example, is, is a dominant introverted sensation type. And uh, she, she has a very, she has a very sensitive palate. She, she is usually does a lot of the cooking. She prefers to do the cooking because she can cook the things right. And every time we sit down to dinner, she will eat the food and she will say, she, she will know that uh, what, she, what she's doing is she is comparing what she is tasting here and now with the sort of ideal sensations that she has in her own mind. And she compares those sensations to that ideal sensation. And it's that ideal sensation which is more real for her than the sensations in the here and now. And so she will, she will taste and say, this, it tastes like it has too much salt. It, this shouldn't have as much salt as it does at the moment. Whereas I'm sitting there um, and I'm like, oh, this is a salty dish. But for her, it's like, no, that this this tastes like it has, this tastes like it has, it's more salty than the way it the way that it should have salt. Um, and if you're clever, you might notice there's some relation with judgment, which I, I, I don't really have time to get into that right now, <laughs> but it's a valid observation. Um, so anyway, you get, but but 
you get a, a conservatism there. It's not live in the moment. Um, one of the other things my mother would do is, is when something flashy or, or wild or very quick would happen, it would like, she would take a moment and she would just say, I'm just processing what just happened. And she's processing the, the sensory aspect of it. So they, they all also will often be very good journal keepers, very meticulous, able to remember all of the details um, and, and repeat those back. So, so ho I, I, I hope I'm not taking up too much time. Um, I'll try to move through these at a, at a better pace. No, no, we have plenty of time. You can uh, take your oh, time okay. with more examples. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So now we move on to intuition. We have extroverted intuition, which is a perception of implications and possibilities brought outwards. So it is a focus on ideas and possibilities that I am not an extroverted intuitive type, so I often struggle to describe it sometimes, just so you know. <laughs> and that is sometimes itself a good test of your own type, is which of the functions naturally makes a lot more sense to you. Um, but uh, as it's been nicely put, put here in the slide, the squirrel spirit. If you've heard the old joke, it's like, I, I have ADD. I, I have trouble focusing on squirrel, right? Um, there's there's this fascination with possibilities that are out there in the world so there there can be a bit of a um almost like they're juggling a lot of different ideas at at one time um but more importantly it's the fact that those those ideas are out there so there's a tendency to um i think a better way of putting it is it's almost like ideas are actual objects for them that exist outside of themselves and exist on their own. Um, so the result of this is that ideas tend to diverge for them. Um, from one observation, you can derive 10 new and distinct ideas from it. So there's this branching out and it very quickly can turn into a kind of chaos for them. So, the, but it's very, very fruitful because they will see all of the ways you can split up one topic into different topics. Introverted intuition does sort of the opposite. Introverted intuition, because it turns inwards, has a tendency to see similarities between things to a certain extent and, and to say, this idea is really just this idea. If you put them next to each other, you can sort of collapse things into each other and as it said here very nicely, from 10 observations, you derive one, in, in, uh, one sort of vision or one underlying principle, as it were. Uh, one of the ways that I, I've described this is extroverted intuition is almost like, um, well, it, it's put very nicely. You have one point, and then you draw an infinite number of lines through that one point. Uh, to show all of the different ways you can diverge from that one point. Um, whereas intuition or introverted intuition, you have say 10 points and then you try to draw a line of best fit. If you know that from algebra, you try to draw a single line that sort of averages out all of those individual observations. And that is the the single idea which is then kept in introverted intuition. So kind of like with introverted sensation, where I mentioned this notion of having ideal sensations that you kind of use to organize um, the sensations in the outside world, similar idea with introverted intuition, but with ideas. You have sort of a single idea that you are relating things back to. So Ex, one, of the, one of the things that results from this is extroverted intuition is stereotypically, it doesn't necessarily look like this, but stereotypically, lots of different ideas, um, very kind of scattered brained, running all over the place. Um, whereas introverted intuition is like, I zero in, I have the eyes that stare into your soul, you know, kind of like the chess grandmaster or something like that, you know. Um, thinking. Thinking is judgment that is based on logic and facts. <laughs> and it's broader than that, but that's the quickest way to explain it. 
So extroverted thinking is focused on, uh, uh, as it's put here, it's very goal oriented. It's very, I want to accomplish things out there in the world. I want to organize the actual materials or people or resources that I see outside of me. Um, I want to work with the external facts of a situation. It can also be much more interested in statistics and in using statistics to say, here's where we should go with something. Here's how we make things more efficient. Well, actually, Excuse maybe me. I can add on one point on the extroverted thing. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. So I always feel that a very common misconception people have is that they would think they always have this mindset that uh, extroversion means oh party animal, you know. So when I I meet someone and I say oh I think you know you're very strong in extro this thing called extrovert thinking, they will often think oh I'm I'm not an extrovert, you know I I'm just doing doing all the work in the background, you know. But it is the precisely the fact that they are doing all the work uh, that is that is their extroversion and that is the Jungian um, definition of extroversion that that is that we don't really use nowadays. Thank you, Ching. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, uh, it's it's important to sort of leave aside some of the your preconceptions about what extroversion and introversion mean in order to properly understand these. You can get people who will seem very seem very introverted in a colloquial sense, in a in a everyday sense, but the way that their mind actually functions would be described better by one of the extroverted functions, uh, perhaps. And as we shall see soon, everybody has extroverted sides and introverted sides. It's just a matter of how they are arranged in relation to each other. So it's never as simple as, um, as, uh, as just if you're a party animal or you wanna stay home and read books. Um, never as simple as that. So that's extroverted thinking, very pragmatic. Introverted thinking, um, Again, we have this idea where it's, it's almost the thinking idea inside of one's own subject, which takes precedence over the facts out there. So there's, there's, um, there's a focus on refining the logical ideas, refining and making those ideas perfectly precise. Pure mathematics, almost all the time, that's where you're going to find more introverted thinking types. Um, but they're much more interested in the theory and in making things logical and consistent and then taking that theory and then after the fact, applying it to what's going on out there. But they're always much more interested in making the, the definitions and ideas more precise. If you are familiar with say, Rene Descartes, um, Descartes, very quickly, he's a French philosopher, if you don't know, but he, um, way back when he's famous for saying, I think, therefore I am, um, that is very introverted thinking <laughs> because what he literally did was said, I can't trust any of my, uh, any external knowledge of the outside world because, you know, it's possible that I am deceived or I'm hallucinating or I'm dreaming or something. All I can trust, what is more real for me, is my own thoughts, my own uh, principles that I've developed. This is very introverted thinking. Excuse me. So that's how those two go. You kind of have this difference between theory and practice would be a very general way of, of differentiating them. Finally, we have feeling. Extroverted feeling is a feeling which is sort of directed outwards. Excuse me. It is objectified. So one of the interesting things about this is extroverted feeling will, will generally be much more, much more naturally outwardly expressive. Um, it will be in tune with uh, what expressions are in some sense the most socially or socially acceptable or most harmonious. Um, to the needs of the group. Um, Ching wrote a nice little thing, uh, actually a very nice little description here. Each individual is, is uh, one mosaic of a beautiful group dance and everyone needs to play their part. That's great. Um, the dance especially is a great way of putting it because you have this notion of the need to, um, to not focus on how you're feeling or your own feelings, but to harmonize with the group, 
and to try to promote the feelings of the group as a whole. So you see there's this movement outwards in terms of one's ethics. Um, and when someone is dominated extroverted feeling, there, there will often be this sort of blurring of the line where they will literally feel what, well, from the introverted feeling perspective that we'll get into, they will be feeling as it were what should be felt or, and if they're not feeling what should be felt, then they're like, the, something's wrong. If I'm not crying at a funeral, something's probably wrong. And what is, what is wrong? This isn't how you're supposed to feel objectively in this situation. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, also very sensitive to you don't, you having proper bedside manners, if you will. Um, you don't say certain things to certain people because you're just going to screw everything up. Introverted feeling is where the feeling is directed inwards. It's much more, what is much more important is, and it's, it, it's difficult to express this sometimes because um, uh, because some of we have to get past some of the connotations of the language because when I say, for example, um, they're much more focused on how they are feeling, it sounds as though they're self-absorbed and selfish. And from the extroverted feeling perspective, they are. From that perspective, that's what's going on. But then that gets challenged when you find that some of the most empathetic and self-sacrificing people I've met have been introverted feeling types. And, and that's because it's, it sort of messes with the, the selfishness, selflessness division. Um, introverted feeling, what it is, is you can tell I do not relate as much to introverted feeling because I'm having trouble describing it properly, but um, it, is, uh, it is that feeling which is, it's that feeling which is internal. Um, that is individual to you. Um, there is a there is a sense of your your if if you're crying at a funeral because you knew the person and you had a personal connection with them and you you are genuinely like this is how I feel regardless of how everybody else is feeling. That's good because that indicates that you are more in alignment with your own feelings and your own soul. But if you're just crying at the funeral because that's what you're supposed to do, then that's like, then who are you? You're like an empty shell. I want to know who you are. Um, I've had, I once had an argument with a friend of mine who wasn't dominated, dominant introverted feeling, but they had that in there as one of their major functions. And they were always asking me like, so how do you feel about this or that? controversial issue right and they're like this was conversation to them they're like how do you feel about it and i being more extroverted feeling was always like i don't really want to answer that because that just doesn't seem what's more important is how are you going to react to how i feel about such and such like i don't really feel anything myself i'm feeling I think about it myself. I have this introverted thinking relationship to it. But as far as my feelings go, those just seem so ephemeral and so kind of unrelated to the topic and would really just, really just, it would turn into just us arguing over whose feelings are right. And that wasn't useful, but that wasn't how she thought about things. So, so that's your crash course in the eight functions. Great. So uh, it's a lot. It's a lot, you're not gonna get it all at once. It's something that I had to sit down and, and really kind of run through this and, um, and I don't know, just kind of get it down pat. You'll understand your own functions better. Um, and that's often a good indication of what functions you prefer. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Hopefully you are now, you are now masters of the, uh, of the eight functions, my crash course, uh, as long as you're able to follow all this. Anyone um, have any questions? Sorry. Uh, anyone have questions for Michael? For moving on, uh, assuming we still have time to, to move on. Or... Oh, we have time. Yes, there's no problem. Okay. Have one hour. So. Okay, cool. Dean, your side, any, your side had any questions? Okay, yeah, we have one question from uh, Nina. So, yeah, we need to try to answer the question. 
Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, for the auxiliary and tertiary function, right? Um, like, what's the difference and like, when do we use it? Could you, I, I'm so sorry, could you repeat that one more time? For the auxiliary function and tertiary function, right? What's the difference and when do we actually use those functions? Gotcha. Well, it's great you asked that because that's what I was just about to get into in the presentation. So um, I can I can answer that right now for you. Um, so the way the way it works is um, the way that the functions are organized in a personality. This is the way that it's uh, developed. Is you have four function slots, as it were. You have the dominant function. You have the auxiliary function the tertiary function and the primitive or inferior function. Um, and we'll, we'll start with the dominant and then move into auxiliary and tertiary. The dominant function is the dominant one. It's the one that sort of most defines you and the way that you, you tend to think. It's the one that you use the most, um, nicely compared with walking here, which I know is drawn from, from the book. Thank you, Cheng. Yes, it's the most easy and natural thing for you to do um, and it, in some cases, can be so natural that the, that the person will not even notice that that is definitely their mode of, of thinking. And that can actually sometimes be a bit of a, uh, a challenge in typing, typing people, or at least in self-typing. But in any case, so that, that's sort of the easiest one to understand in a lot of ways. Um, the auxiliary function uh, is because you have the dominant function, but in order to function as a person in general, uh, you can't just have one function because you would probably get yourself killed <laughs> because you need multiple ways to see and to situate yourself in reality. So you have to start off with the auxiliary function, which compensates your dominant function. So there's always a bit of opposition there and, um, but the auxiliary, nice comparison is to say swimming. It requires more effort to do it, but you can do it. And it, it's very useful for you to orient yourself in society. So for example, I believe my dominant function is introverted intuition. So that's what I sort of just do in the background all the time naturally. And um, it, it's, it's my book. I would say is very NI in a lot of respects. Um, and it's difficult to explain precisely what I mean by that at the moment. But the point is my auxiliary function is extroverted feeling. Um, so that is, that is what helps compensate my introverted intuition so that I'm not just sitting in my room like staring and reading a text and trying to understand the secrets of the universe. I can actually go out and like, buy food <laughs> and act like a normal human being. That's a silly way of putting it, but more importantly, it, I associate it with my ability to, um, uh, to, to situate myself in relation to other people and also a concern with social harmony. Uh, Cheng, you wanted to say yeah, something? I, just, uh, I want to say that I, I think um, for uh, the FE, auxiliary FE really helps in terms of uh, going to a teaching role because you're always foc focused on translating that, that vision into something that's palatable to the people you are speaking to. And you will tailor it specifically to the people you are uh, talking and speaking to. Exactly. Yes. Um, so, and, you know, you get, it's somewhat the same with the other way around, but the focuses would be different. So, um, but yes, uh, it's not the thing that you're naturally doing. It's something that assists your dominant function um, with what it wants to do. So then you get the tertiary function. The tertiary function, uh, it is something that you are very interested in, but you may not realize that you're not actually the best there ever was at it. There can often be a bit of overestimation of one's abilities with the tertiary function. It's a so... <laughs> I, I, I like the term here. <laughs> the, the action metaphor is lusting, um, though you might, you might associate it more with um, 
there's an infatuation, a fascination. Um, you're attracted to it, um, and yet there's it, it's one dimensional in your understanding of it, which sometimes can be a benefit. Um, but you're not actually if when you go up against somebody who is dominant in that function, um, it often becomes clear where the weaknesses lie or where the naivete lies, where the the lack of cultivation there lies. I also like the glass cannon uh, comparison. That's actually very good because there can. So my tertiary function is introverted thinking. And you can see this, say, in the book where I'm using the I Ching precisely because it is extremely like strict. It's like computer code, right? And I'm like creating these strict structures that are very, you know, um, very introverted thinking, very logical, and they build one thing after the other. Um, and so I'm over here, like my natural tendency would be to say, wow, I'm like, it's like I'm an introverted thinking type. I'm a master at the, at the logics and the figuring things out. And then you compare it with my father, who is an introverted thinking dominant type. And he is an actual mathematician, and he can manipulate concepts and, and logical concepts in a way that I is just completely out of my league. And so, but in a way he's much more, he would not make some of the bold leaps that I make in introverted thinking precisely because he's more of a veteran with it. So there's, there's a trade-off there. Um, so that, that's sort of the scratching the surface of auxiliary and tertiary. I, I, I hope that maybe helps to differentiate them a bit. Um, In some sense, uh, the auxiliary function um, is something that you you you're better at it than the tertiary function, but you don't you don't have the same fascination with it. So you're you're better at doing it, but it it will sometimes not feel as rewarding as the tertiary function, which the tertiary function. You, you aren't as good at it, but you also like it more in a certain respect. That, that would be sort of a quick and, quick and rough way of, of differentiating the two. Oh, maybe just one part I can add for like the tertiary. Yes. Yeah, so I think this would be quite interesting for you as well, Michael, um, for us to share. In, in Chinese, there is a, a phrase that, that means like throwing off in front of a master. Yeah. So, fan uh, nong yeah, so uh, it is. It is. I use this this phrase to to help people differentiate between dominant and tertiary, because basically when when a, per a person you know who uses the tertiary function meets someone who is using it in dominant, he would he would be exactly that that phrase where you are showing off in front of this of, of a master. Yeah. That I really like that because that's exactly what happens. <laughs> and... It's uh, that's actually a very I hadn't heard that phrase. That's very good. Yeah, and also like maybe also like to some examples I can think of is you know I, um, maybe a, a friend who was an ENFJ and she's saying that uh, uh, a boyfriend of X was a ESTP and so the ESTP is like uh, tertiary function is extroverted feeling so it's a super party animal super social butterfly everybody he meets like hey what's up hey what's up you know and like super friendly with everybody whereas to the ENFJ she might think. Hey, you know, you don't really need to be that friendly to everybody. You know, actually, yes. you might even be giving. You are actually ex inadvertently encouraging the the inappropriate people or the, the wrong people to be to be to think that they are they are they are popular or something. You know, and you know, actually ruin dynamics. You are friendly to everybody so uh, sim simplistically. Right. Yeah. So it shows yes. that level of like do um, the actual nuance of the dominant function versus the one dynamic yes that's very good and in in some sense there is a uh descending there's a descending order of maturity to the functions is another way of of characterizing it where the dominant function is your most mature function the auxiliary function is it's pretty mature but it's it's almost like the the assistant to the hero the tertiary is much, much younger, much less experienced. And finally, you get the inferior function, 
which is the least experienced and often the most uh, sort of all or nothing in a lot of ways. Um, you compared it to tiptoeing, which is very nice. Um, difficult and low payoff that one may get away with suppressing and ignoring it altogether, yet a worthwhile challenge if one wishes to turn all weaknesses and blind spots into strengths and also a source of unusual elegance. It's a very nice way of putting it. Um, the way this works, by the way, is the dominant function. So all of the functions have a function which is the most directly opposite to it, um, at least in, in this particular way. And that's where you get this notion of function axes, which I don't think we'll get into tonight. But um, the, the dominant function, we say, represses its opposite function. And its opposite function thereby becomes the inferior function. So introverted intuition is opposed to extroverted sensation. Because extroverted sensation has to do with the actual objects outside of me, whereas introverted intuition has to do with the ideas inside of me. Um, and so you have this repression between the two of them. Um, and yet it's it's sort of a yin yang. It's a complementary association between them because you can't have one without the other. Um, and you get a similar opposition between the auxiliary and the tertiary. Um, and uh, where you'll, you'll have somebody who say with the ESTP example that Ching gave, the ESTP is much better with introverted thinking and they'll, they'll use that in order to organize their life and to give themselves principles of action. But especially as they get older, they'll become more infatuated with extroverted feeling and almost think that is, feel that is more important and want to associate more with that than with the introverted thinking, which they're much better at. So, so it, it, it's, uh, there's this element of natural ability, self-awareness, engagement. But anyway, that, that's how we, that's sort of the organization for the different types. Um, so you get 16 types and each of the 16 types has four functions in these different slots. The reason that there are only 16 types built from eight functions is because of the natural oppositions I mentioned, where if you have NI as your dominant function, you must have SE as your inferior function. That's just, they always go together in that way. And you can, if you have a perceiving function as your dominant, then you have to have a judge, judging function um, as your auxiliary. So you get these natural oppositions and in this almost very geometrical mathematical way, it works out. So you only end up getting 16 distinct types. So. Yeah, just a small joke to add. Like when I was yes. this before, um, someone, someone uh, mentioned to me, and I'm sure it's a, a dominant TI was mentioning, hey, you know, you have uh, eight different functions and you, you know, you have, if you can, Think of the different ways to merge all of them. Shouldn't there be like you know sixty thousand different types? Yeah, if you have eight, eight functions that you can randomly merge. Yeah, because you know there's someone who's very comfortable in numbers and can very quickly say, hey, there's more than sixteen ways to arrange these eight different functions if there's no rules. You know, yeah. So I just thought it's quite interesting that that's a very nice way to spot a TI user. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. If there were no rules, there would be far, far more. Uh, than uh, just 16 types, but because of which, unfortunately, you're at this point, you're just kind of have to take me on faith here, but you can read my book and there's a lot of other materials online, but it has to do with these natural oppositions between the different functions that excludes many of those possibilities. Um, so you get 16 types, which uh, would I guess be the next slide if we... Uh... <laughs>